come from my island. And uh, I was shocked in the Christmas when I went there. Most of this, uh, our, our show too, with these places. And uh, been rubbishing our environment and our for sure end up in the reef. Uh, it was a shock for me to see them. If we are irresponsibly dumping waste into the very life system that we depend on, what we see is a decrease in the health and the abundance of seafood that we rely on because we are we're creating an environment that's not conducive to healthy and vibrant populations of fish. Even with all those measures in place, and even if we as consumers are well informed, better educated, and can make good choices, we can't do this alone. address this problem, the Pacific has to have one voice. That's why we are opted for a global community to come together, to have a global instrument to tackle this problem. Without that, we'll be facing a huge problem with our ocean. Hello, Falava, and welcome everybody to this session on plastic pollution prevention in the Pacific region, fact sheet launch uh, and discussion. My name is Lang Poiva, as, uh, as Patrick mentioned, and I'm the editor of Pacific Environment Weekly, based out of Samoa. As highlighted in the earlier video, the Pacific Islands exist on the front line of the plastic crisis. Despite not being producers of plastic and contributing as little as 1.3% of global plastic pollution, the region is disproportionately impacted. This session brings together experts from governments, academia, industry, intergovernmental organizations, and civil society to enhance understanding and awareness of the impacts of plastics pollutions on human health and human rights, as well as its contribution to climate change in the context of a discussion around circularity. Panelists will discuss the strategies and the policy changes needed to address these impacts. And we will also launch this very exciting five plastic pollution prevention fact sheets. Now, without further ado, I'd like now to introduce our first speaker, the Fionga Ali Muamuase Toa Apo. He is the Principal Waste Management Officer at the Ministry of Natural Resource and Environment in Samoa. Malosai Fua, Li Muamua. Faftailang Poiba. Talofa once again, greetings from Samoa. Mr. Sifamaia Lawandra. Pacific Sub-Regional Office, United Nations Environment Program, the distinguished speakers, panelists, participants, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure for me to be here to deliver the high level introduction for this session, even though it's last minute, but I'm deeply uh, honored to be here. Well, Pacific Islanders have a close and deep connection to the marine environment. It is part of our daily lives, and this relationship is well documented in our myths and legends. This unique connectivity is harmed, putting the Pacific Islanders in the forefront of two global environment problems, mainly climate change and plastic pollution. As Sherelle has mentioned, we are only contributed to 1.3% of mismanaged plastic in the world's ocean, but we are recipient. Recently, a study in the Pacific found plastic debris in 97% of the salmon fish species. This is an eye opener for us and a threat as well to our health and us in the Pacific are highly dependent on our fish resources for protein. 
In addition, a survey of 159 coral reefs in the Asia Pacific region estimated about 11.1 billion plastic items entangled in the corals, leading to abrasion, suffocation, and mortality. Just a brief um, from Samoa's experience. I was leading the planning of plastic in Samoa in 2018. It all started from a simple email and things got escalated from there. And perhaps fortunately, at the end of, of that same year, a regulation was endorsed. And the effective date of that regulation was 1st of January, 2019. And this year, we introduced styrofoam food containers in our band. We are doing it face by face. And we're here to witness the launching of these five fact sheets. I would like to congratulate my colleague, Dr. Sasha, Dr. Trusilia, and other colleagues for developing of these uh, very, very informative fact sheets. And lastly, I would like to congratulate and thank you for the UNEP for, fun for funding of these fact sheets. Of course, they will be very, very useful for the Pacific as materials for awareness and education of materials. And looking forward to have a very, very fruitful discussion of these fact sheets. Faftai Lava. Faftai Li'ibomua, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's truly an honor for us to have you as a as you say, last minute, but uh, it really speaks to the true nature of resilience uh, of uh, Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment in Samoa that you can step in very prepared and um, with charming intellect uh, to suit. I'd also like to once again congratulate Samoa on the introduction of the plastic ban. That was a almost miraculous effort given the speed that it went um, into policy. And now I uh, would like to move on to the very exciting um, next part of our session, and that is the launch of the fact sheets. Now we will be showing you a video. Uh, it will be a bit lengthy, but you will um, enjoy and you'll get most of uh, the point of the launch today. Um, and I'd like to just reflect before we move into to the launch that fact sheets, although it may sound simplistic, uh, it's actually one of the key tools of communicating uh, uh, plastic pollution in the Pacific. Uh, most of our schools, most of our organizations and ministries still depend on paper to communicate a lot of the changes that are going on in governments and some of the good changes that are uh, put into place when it comes to plastic pollution. So these fact sheets are key to communicating those changes uh, on the ground. So I'd now like to uh, introduce this fact sheet launch Nisa Bolivinaka, Talofa, Malo Elelei, Kiorana, Kiora Kotou Katoa. Kotrasia Farrelly Tokuingwa, and I'm a Pakia Plastics Pollution Researcher and the co director of the Political Ecology Research Centre at Te Kuninga Purihuroa, Massey University, Papaioia, Aotearoa, New Zealand. I developed the five fact sheets launched today with Dr. Sasha Fuller and representatives from Pacific Island countries in partnership with UNEP and CL. They were designed by Nadia Vaala, graphic designs in Apia. The fact sheets make recommendations for preventing plastic pollution and all recommendations are specific to the Pacific region. It now gives me great pleasure to launch the first of the fact sheets, a safer circular economy for plastics in the Pacific region. This is the capstone fact sheet as the recommendations from the other four fact sheets all relate back to this one. All the fact sheets were developed from the results of the Pacific Islands Plastic Pollution Prevention Policy Gap Analysis, published with EIA in 2020. The study showed that national plastics pollution prevention plans and policy frameworks are urgently needed with a focus on preventing problematic plastics entering the region. The study also highlighted that a legally binding plastics pollution treaty would significantly increase the success of those plans and policy frameworks. We've referred to a safer economy for plastics rather than a safe economy for plastics because we acknowledge that there is no such thing as a 100% safe economy where plastics are concerned. It is for this reason 
that the fact sheet emphasises the need to prevent plastic pollution, or the problematic plastics at least, entering the region before they harm people and environment and become, ex become expensive to manage and remove. It also highlights the need to invest in safe reuse, refill, repurpose and repair infrastructure and services, as well as extended producer re responsibility, including return schemes, repatriation and remediation. This fact sheet represents a safe, toxic-free and rights-based approach to plastic pollution prevention and highlights state obligations and corporate responsibilities to protect Te Moana Nui. Sasha and I welcome any questions about any of the fact sheets launched today. Fafatai. Good afternoon. I am Patricia Patty Pedras from the Everson National Government Department of Environment, Climate Change and Emergency Management. Today, I am pleased to launch Fact Sheet 2, Plastic Pollution Policy Gaps in the Pacific Region. We know that plastic pollution comes from various sources through air, land, and sea. It is transboundary. Throughout the Pacific, there are still gaps in policy which impede the prevention of plastics pollution. As Pacific Islanders, the ocean plays an important role in our lives. Throughout the Federated States of Micronesia, people have become more reliant on imported, unsustainable products. Our lifestyle has changed drastically from the use of organic materials to the use of non-refillable and packaged products. Our nation is largely dependent on imported food and beverages, which has led to an increase in plastics and plastics packaging. Waste and its management was not previously an issue in FSM because organic products were part of the natural cycle. Today, the increase in waste, particularly plastic pollution, is a major issue. We can see it everywhere. In our ocean and on our shorelines, we have witnessed the arrival of big businesses and government's careless actions as plastic, styrofoam, and various types of waste have invaded our ecosystems, harming the environment and human health. This is able to happen because policy frameworks in the Pacific region still do not capture the full life cycle of plastics. In FSM, we are taking steps towards preventing plastics pollution. FSM implemented a single-use and styrofoam items import prohibition legislation in July 2020. Yet, we are still trying to modify the legislation as we are learning that we need to emphasize the various types of plastics in relation to microplastics. We want to add a penalty section since we are learning that some businesses do not want to consider alternatives, rather finding ways to import single use and styrofoam food and service items. Despite our efforts, there are still gaps. There is no return program, no extended producer responsibility, no legislation addressing microplastics. So although some precautionary and preventive measures for waste management have been implemented in the FSM, our legislation is not strong enough to prevent plastic pollutions from outside businesses, governments, and industry. We must aim to protect human health and the environment through policies and legislation that aim at the top of the zero waste hierarchy, at prevention rather than management. It is also recommended that since plastic pollution is a global issue, a globally binding instrument should be in place to accelerate countries' commitment to tackle plastic pollution. Strengthen policy frameworks and a coordinated global response will prevent the harmful impacts of plastics pollution on our Pacific environments and our peoples. Thank you. Good afternoon, Talofa Bulavinaka Kiorana. My name is Imogen Ingram and I hold the traditional leader's title of Te Pamateapo in Matavira Village on Rarotonga Cook Islands. Since the formation of Island Sustainability Alliance in 2005 to advance the UN Chemicals and Waste Conventions and Sustainable Development, I have worked mainly with National Toxics Network Australia and IPEN, International Pollution Elimination Network, to advocate for the issues of Pacific Island small island developing states whose needs and experiences are often overlooked. I'm happy to be here to launch Fact Sheet 3, Plastics Marine Litter 
and climate in the Pacific region. In September this year, Pacific Environment Ministers circulated a declaration for endorsement by Pacific leaders, stating that plastics and climate change are inextricably linked, particularly in their production and disposal. This inextricable link occurs along the full life cycle of plastics, particularly in the use of fossil fuels to manufacture plastics and the frequent disposal of plastics by incineration, resulting in toxic greenhouse gases. Another link is between plastics pollution and climate change impact on phytoplankton and zooplankton, the tiny marine growth that smaller marine life feeds on. Studies show that these planktons play a key role in carbon storage in the ocean. However, as plastics degrade over time into nano and microplastics, they pass into these planktons, carrying the toxic chemicals with them. This affects the ability of the plankton to reproduce and results in less plankton to capture carbon. In the Cook Islands, we do not produce plastics. The increase in plastics pollution has come about through increased importation of food and beverages and the tourist industry. Much of this plastic waste ends up in the landfill and also, I'm sorry to say, a lot of it is burnt in backyards. This creates the toxic air pollutant called dioxin. A further concern is plastic waste from airlines, which in Rarotonga is incinerated within the airport perimeter. There have been periodic complaints from neighbouring residents about pungent smoke, which is said to be a result of the incinerator working inefficiently due to poor separation of wastes, like separating plastic tumblers from wet food waste. These examples make clear that the relationship between climate change along the plastics life cycle has serious impacts not only for human health, but also for our Pacific Island ecosystems. On that note, it also gives me great pleasure to launch Fact Street 4, Plastics Impacts on Human Health in the Pacific Region. Plastics contain endocrine disrupting chemicals, or EDCs, and people breathe in these pollutants as fumes and smoke, or take them in with the food and beverages they eat and drink. Nanomaterials used in cosmetics can be absorbed through the skin. Plastic pollution directly affects the brain and nervous system, lungs, heart and circulatory system, kidneys, gut, and the ability to have children. It is difficult to truly know the current impact of plastics pollution on human health in the Cook Islands and the Pacific region because little research has been published with evidence from the South Pacific. Under the Basel Convention, plastics are now classified as hazardous waste. But because of low economic and political influence, Pacific Islands importers have little control over the plastics in the products they import or the packaging used. Setting global production standards and clear labelling, together with banning the import of harmful or problematic plastics, would greatly benefit the health of Pacific Island peoples. Looking ahead, Pacific leaders need to protect not only the present generation, but also future generations of Pacific peoples from the climate-related and chemical harms of plastics. Protections are needed for our marine ecosystems and biodiversity upon which Pacific Islands people depend for food. Instead of striving to achieve ever higher economic growth at the expense of the environment, we need to work towards a circular economy that creates little waste and focuses on sharing benefits, leaving no one behind. For the Pacific Swids, we make the following recommendations. One, global plastics pollution problem requires a global solution. We need to join other regions and support a legally binding convention on marine plastic pollution. Two, develop national action plans for preventing plastic pollution. This could include container deposit legislation, advanced disposal fees, reverse logistics for shipping, transitions to a safer circular economy, and building the scientific capacity of our nations. In conclusion, plastics pollute our marine ecosystems and contribute contribute to the impact of climate change. Our food web becomes toxic and degraded due to plastics pollution, undermining the relationships of Pacific peoples with the environment and each other. Prevention of plastics pollution will restore our ecosystems and improve human health and well-being, not to mention the positive impacts this would have on economies and tourism and advancing the sustainable development goals. These benefits will last for centuries. 
Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. We're about to launch the final in the series of the fact sheets entitled The Business of Plastics, Plastic Pollution Impacts on Human Rights in the Pacific Region, with a dedicated message by the United Nations Special Reporter on Toxics and Human Rights. Hello, everyone. My name is Marco Sorellana. I have the pleasure of addressing you today in my capacity as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Toxics and Human Rights. Over the past few years, numerous scientific and other studies have revealed the global magnitude of the plastics threat. There can be no doubt that overcoming this crisis will require concerted international action and cooperation. In the design of a new international treaty on plastics, we need to keep in mind that the plastics crisis is not just about waste. The whole cycle of plastics has serious impacts on people and their rights. Last month, I presented a report on plastics and human rights to the UN General Assembly. It documents the impacts on human rights in every stage of the plastic cycle. For example, the stage of extraction of fossil fuels that make up plastic feedstock has direct and negative impacts on indigenous peoples who constantly suffer from toxic spills in their rivers. The stage of manufacturing of plastics releases emissions of hazardous pollutants that negatively impact on frontline communities. At the stage of use, exposure of consumers to the thousands of toxic additives in plastic consumer products is of grave concern. The waste stage is similarly troubling, with volumes of plastic wastes often dumped in poor communities or exported to poor countries where it is often burned with the consequent negative impacts on human health. In my report on plastics and human rights, I also highlight the importance of assessment of alternatives to avoid misleading or false solutions. For example, less than 10% of plastic wastes are currently recycled. Recycling is thus today more of a mirage that creates an optical illusion. Similarly, open burning and incineration generate toxic dioxins and other persistent organic pollutants that are extremely harmful to human health and the environment. A human rights-based approach is critical to an effective and legitimate legally binding global instrument. Human rights principles can and should inform the transition towards a chemically safe circular economy. Informed participation is crucial to effective design and implementation. A rights-based approach can ensure that solutions to the global plastics crisis actually work and do not come at the expense of those most vulnerable in society. Thank you very much for your attention. This is truly uh, an extraordinary effort um, that no doubt required uh, a lot of uh, collaboration emails, which I'm sure we're flying back and forth. I've been involved in a few of these and I'm telling you it's no easy uh, feat. So I'd like to congratulate uh, the waste experts of the Pacific Islands and Dr. Farley and Dr. Fuller on this extraordinary translation of the science for non-specialists. Uh, this will no doubt be a valuable resource for years to come on plastic pollution. Now, a question was asked regarding the availability of the fact sheets, they will be made available on the UNEP website as well as the SPREP website. But if you'd like access to them um, immediately, uh, you are welcome to email Sasha herself. Her email is in the chat and I'm sure she'll be able to share the fact sheets with you. So once again, congratulations to everyone who was involved. And now we're going to move into uh, one of the most exciting things I find on these sessions is the panel discussion, because that's really when we hear from the experts um, who are working on the ground, 
um, and who support the government and those who support the governments of the Pacific in achieving their goals uh, on plastic pollution. So without further ado, I'd like to, sorry, firstly, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat uh, and then we will be moderating that as we go along. So. Uh, the first question, I'll, I'll just direct this to, to Dr. Farley. Now, it's, it's about organizing these fact sheets, uh, and then we'll go further into the substance of it. What to you was the highlight um, of this project in pulling all of this together? Um, definitely co-learning. This is, you know, that that's the pleasure of the work that we do. Um, you know, we're not experts in all elements of the science of plastics. We're not toxicologists necessarily, or you know, although we're developing some clear understandings about, you know, endocrine disrupting chemicals and Imogen. I can see her you know, nodding her head because we learn a lot from Imogen and her role in the Pacific in that regard. Um, so co-learning about policy, co-learning about toxicants and chemicals about how to design a safe uh, circular economy for plastics um, and also learning about specific challenges and needs across such a huge region um, of so many different cultures, so many challenges, uh, so many strengths and drivers um, and, uh, you know, and, and what those needs are and how we can try to speak to such a broad diversity of challenges and strengths in, across all five uh, fact sheets. Uh, there was a question I could see on the chat and thank you very much for that around, you know, who is the target audience? And that's a, that's a very important question to ask. Um, and the answer to that question um, is to policy policymakers and government representatives at this stage. Um, you know, we, we feel very strongly about the need for policy change, legislation, plans and strategies. Um, and that, that's a, it's a really important place to be. But we also need to speak to a broad range of publics and local communities and age groups and schools and women's groups and church groups and so on and so on and so on. And so there's, we do also recognise that there's a real challenge ahead of us and interpreting these in a way that can be used for the broadest audience across the huge, this vast area uh, that is the Pacific region. So thank you for that question. And uh, that's a challenge ahead of us. Right. So that's purely from a nerdy communications perspective is, um, you know, and you've touched on that issue of like, how do you fairly cover and translate the science of this particular issue, but while reflecting um, the diversity of the Pacific. So I'd now like to move to uh, Patty uh, the, from the Department of Environment, FSM. Uh, just a quick question, Patty, if you can hear me okay. Uh, from your own um, perspective, what would a policy framework uh, look like supporting a safer circular economy for plastics in the Pacific region? Patty, uh, just checking if you could hear me, um, if you can. Patty, you can turn on your audio in the other direction. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, sincere apologies. Um, my internet seems to be uh, unstable at the moment, but thank you for that question. And um, uh, thank you also to um, Sasha and, uh, and um, Trisha. And of course, the speakers uh, after me. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And in response to that question, um, that's a very good question uh, because it would actually uh, involve um, everyone. And I note that as we started this discussion, um, we are actually talking about um, including all groups of people. And um, that would you know, require a major consultation with um, everyone concerned. And I guess we have to start from um, within our own um, areas and all, our own lands before we uh, merge with other countries and band together as a global community to address that. Um, at the global level. 
So um, I think if uh, it, I think this forum is a is a very positive one in that it's bringing countries together to identify uh, their weaknesses, their challenges, and of course their um, strengths. And from there, I, I believe that um, you know we can continue um, with what uh, our leaders um, have been trying to address at the international level. Um, we are aware that. Uh, we are aware that uh, there has been um, meetings going on at the international level, um, uh, especially at UNEA with our leaders about the global instrument. Um, so, you know, that's that's something that we would like to push um, uh, from our end. And but I think uh, once again, I think we should really start from within our um, countries to look at our uh, our challenges and see how we can um, uh, address them um, in collaboration with our, our regional partners, um, so that we can come up with a holistic <laughs> policy, uh, one that will include everyone, and that uh, you know not just everyone within our um, areas, but uh, in relation to the to the rest of the world. Thank I you. I think that's how I understand your question. Yeah. Yes, yes, you've definitely touched on it from a national perspective. And I do agree that, you know, um, where possible in the Pacific, it does have to be driven from the national um, level. So I just want to come back to you, Dr. Farley, given that this is your area of expertise in the region and the fact that you might be the only political ecologist in the Pacific region, <laughs> what would be your, your perspective on this? You know, what, um, and just so that for the benefit of those who, who may not have heard the question is, what would a policy framework supporting a safe circular economy for plastics in the Pacific region look like? Thanks, Sherelle. Yeah, so for, for us, I mean, first of all, uh, for those who don't know what a political ecologist is, and you will be forgiven if you don't know, it's, it's not not it's not in common sort of language, this, this term political ecology, essentially what it is, political ecologists or political ecology um, is all about understanding how people have uh, different uh, diverse accesses um, and distributions of the benefits of the health of the environment, it's about human environment interactions, it's about understanding how different cultures um, uh, live live uh, in, their, in their environment with their environment um, differently. Um, so I'm really interested in the politics and the dynamics that um, exist between humans and resources and how they see themselves as part of the environment, not separate from it, for example. So just, just with that sort of entry point for us, for the safe circular economy, how do we see that uh, in terms of policy? We really want to see that first and foremost, and I think you'll see this across the fact sheets, um, focusing first and foremost on prevention, absolutely prevention. And um, we're talking about um, preventing the influx, the inflow of the most problematic plastics that are in global circulation today. So again, referring back to human health, thank you, Imogen, you know, around endocrine disrupting chemicals, those hormone mimickers found in pretty much all the plastics that are in circulation today, the persistent organic pollutants, those forever chemicals in many plastics that we have, um, that we import into countries. Those are the ones we want to be really careful about bringing in um, because it has um, impacts that are passed on from whānau to whānau, from generation to generation, um, and really does affect um, our ability to reproduce, as Imogen said, and various other diseases. But we're really interested in eliminating those most hazardous plastics all along the life cycle. Um, but for the Pacific, because we don't produce plastics, we manufacture some, a small amount of plastics, uh, but really it's about import, it's about tourism, it's about what comes in on ships and planes, it come, it's all about the transboundary flows of plastics that move through, um, you know, move through ocean, um, ocean gyres, for example, and, and wash up on the shores of the Pacific. The responsibility for those lies thousands of kilometres away, and yet the Pacific Islands are left dealing with the mess. 
there's an injustice here and injustice is really part of political economy and ecologies so climate change impacts biodiversity loss the microplastics that we barely deal with in policy and legislation anywhere not just in the region of the pacific but anywhere in, in national legislation toxic chemicals and human rights so really prevention is a short answer to that question Shira. kia ora Thank you, Dr. Farley, and also thank you for introducing us to the concept of political ecologist. That's something new for me. <laughs> um, so once again, if you've just joined us, this is the launch of fact sheets uh, sponsored by UNEP. Uh, and we are now talking to experts from the Pacific Islands on waste and plastic pollution. And we're discussing the various approaches to this issue in the Pacific region. Now, I now like to move to one of my favorite waste experts in the Pacific region, uh, Imogen. Um, I do apologize, I don't have your traditional title here, but I'm sure we can learn that at a later stage. Uh, I just wanna give an anecdote here. So it was actually Imogen that introduced me to the health impacts of microplastics uh, and also of mercury in the Pacific region. She, you will notice Imogen in any waste meeting, uh, international chemicals negotiations, she'll walk in with a very calm presence, but everyone knew that she was in the room. So it is my absolute privilege to ask you this uh, question, Imogen. In which ways can a human rights-based approach be integrated into policies to tackle plastic pollution in the Pacific? <clears throat> I think my preference would be the health aspect because the plastics definitely leach these um, uh, things that affect our hormones. And uh, there was one 2012 UNEP report on the state of the science of EDCs, which, which really touched me. And um, it said things like, or some of these hormones it makes you put on weight. They affect your weight gain, insulin sensitivity, and glucose tolerance, making those affected more likely to become diabetic. And, and then they produced results because only three Pacific Island countries took part in the study. But 20% of adult males and women had diabetes, which was a sharp increase on a similar study compared earlier. Um, so finally, I started to get an explanation for myself about this, you know, it's been called a tsunami of non-communicable diseases, you know, the diabetes, the hypertension. So the hypertension is in some way linked with the methylmercury I spoke with you about when I was doing the hair sampling. And of course, we pick the methylmercury up in the fish we eat. And then the mercury attaches to these tiny plastic particles, which the fish take in. And they're so tiny, you can't see them without a microscope. And then we eat them. <laughs> so so I, I think for me, um, that's the one we really need to worry. And of course, you know, when I talked about this with other guys from Kiribati, which is a big uh, export fishing nation, they said, oh, look, I'm not sure we want everybody to, to think along those lines. They might stop buying our fish. <laughs> and I said, first of all, they fished out their own nation, their own waters, so they have to buy our fish. But if they eat the same fish, then they will also be affected and concerned. And that will help us to get more people concerned about uh, taking action to reduce the pollution. So for me, the plastics are serious pollution, but ocean pollution generally, there's other pollution that also worry some things. Thank you, Imogen, I appreciate that. Um, and now I'd like to ask the next question to Ali Moamua from Samoa. Um, and this is really at the, the nexus of climate impacts and, uh, and waste. So, Plastic exacerbates climate impacts in the Pacific Islands region. Uh, Ali Momoa, from your perspective, uh, what can be done from a public policy perspective to address this cross between uh, plastics and climate change?
Uh, you're currently on mute, Vamon Molly. All right, sorry. Uh, thank you, Lung Boy. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot to be done. Like I mentioned, our they already uh, Sasha and, and, his, and her colleagues already done a cap analysis on our legislative. Our regulation is so so simple. It's just like five pages long, and there are some caps in there. You know, eventually there are some facts that are missed there, like scientific uh, um, evidences that that we need to put in there, and even like the fact sheets that we have launched today. But we need to translate that all these scientific uh, evidences and facts to the local language and local understand for them to to, to absorb that. Uh, for, for instance, when we start our consultation for our regulation of plastic in 2018, people were like, especially the community, community level, they were like, well, we thought there's nothing wrong with plastic. So what uh, the idea that I did, you know, to, 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 to come for them to see the, the, the broad picture was that I use, I use pictures, you no know, of fish you not know, being uh, suffocated by plastic, you know, you know, all the other areas, oceans that you know, plastic in there, the, they were like, is that a problem? Is that in Samoa? And, you know what I told them? If you don't want to see this in Samoa, then you have to accept this. And there's a lot of things that there's a link of, 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 of climate change, the plastic that's in, 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 in the fact sheets that starting from manufacturing of plastic, there's a lot of emission there, like it's already been mentioned by Imogen. And through the policy framework, we need to, for us in Samoa, we need to have those facts, scientific facts. And maybe, uh, maybe early next year, we will we'll be having a research in plastic, microplastic in Samoa. Uh, will be funded by World Bank. And from those, uh, we already received our waste audit uh, report from the World Bank that we worked on last year. And uh, we like, we like you know, to translate all those findings you know, to a community level for them, for this to be very, very effective. Even like when now it's like, you know, we haven't been, been singing in and out, like climate change, climate change, you know. But the knowledge of people in the community is so so little, so small that they need to broaden their, their thinking about what, what really happens. So that's why it's just that there are a lot of things, a lot to be done, and there's a lot of work to be done, and there's a lot of contribution that, especially from around the region, especially for the for this global instrument that we need to come together, you know, let our voice to be heard in the global arena. Thank you. Thank you, Ali Momoa. So true. I mean, a collective voice of the Pacific is much stronger than one for sure. Um, so we have one question. If you have any questions, please put it into the to the chat, uh, and then we can address it um, directly to to our panelists. Now uh, we have a question here for for Dr. So for Tricia. Uh, the question is: There is little evidence of impacts of plastic pollution but there's a plethora elsewhere. Do we need more research? What type of evidence do we need from the Pacific? That's a great question. It's an excellent question. I think that there is a, um, there are gaps in data everywhere. I mean, I'm, I'm from Aotearoa, New Zealand. We have the same problem here uh, and there is the same call for more data. Um, just as a sort of a, a starting point, we know we have enough information now, we need to act urgently. However, yes, we need more data, but we've got enough to know that we really need to turn the tap off. Um, so, yeah, we need more data on, uh, you know, mo we need monitoring, we need, oh, we need clear definitions. It's something that we've also uh, been, been clear about in the fact sheets with, so that we're all speaking the same language. Um, I, I'm hearing and I fully appreciate and agree, and I've mentioned it, we really need to also interpret the language that's quite complex in this field um, to, right down to community level. I just want to reiterate that this is going to be a huge task because some of those ideas, even microplastics, I understand is not a term that is easily kind of interpreted and taken up and understood immediately by all. Um, and we take it for granted 
those of us who work in this space all the time. So it's really important to really to, to think about that. So um, I know I can see there's a number of people on the call. I can see some familiar names here who do research around microplastics in the Pacific and Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, we need more of that good, good, good work. Um, there's some recent research on PFAS, which is an example of what Imogen's talking about. It's a hormone mimicker. Um, it's a persistent organic pollutant. Our colleagues of mine have found that PFAS um, in dolphins recently, which is incredibly devastating to many, as you know, people on this call will know, um, cultures across the Pacific. Um, so as we're finding this more data, it helps us to strengthen policy. But we need strong policy now. We can't wait. Um, I also just want to respond to um, the mention of um, support for a global agreement, a legally binding plastic pollution treaty. Uh, there's a huge amount of support for that across the Pacific. Um, and it's been very, very heartening to see the Pacific Islands plastics declaration recently where uh, many Pacific Island countries have signed on to this. And it's been supported by metropolitan countries uh, in support of a legally binding plastic pollution treaty. So that's really going to add strength and uh, in, in, in preventing a, a, in preventing and um, to protect us from plastic pollution uh, in the Pacific region. Thank you, Tricia. I think the point that you make on translation uh, definitely aligns with the point made by Ali Momua on the need to not just translate the science so that communities can understand it, but also the linguistic translation. I feel like we've just recovered from trying to translate all the climate uh, terms. Uh, so I just, as you were speaking, I was thinking, what is the Sam one word for microplastic? And I'm just going to throw that to Ali Momua just quickly. Do we have a Sam one word for microplastic? You're on mute, just quickly. And then to do that during our consultation, I was, you know, that simple English word took me two sentences to translate it. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> we had the same problem. That's what with I the thought. Yeah. We don't. We didn't create plastics, and yeah. so we have no idea about the name yeah. for plastic. And mm. we certainly didn't create microplastics. <laughs> so mm. We don't have a word for them either. So we just have to work on it. Work on that. And Patty, is that the true for you as well? Uh, yes. I mean, since it's a. Uh, it's a foreign word. Um, the way we, the way we actually describe it uh, is, um, we describe it by texture, how we feel, how it feels to us. But there's no set word for it. So you know, sometimes we we just say uh, plastic, but with, you know, with a little bit of accent to it. <laughs> you can just imagine the description. It's a tiny little thing that is plastic and not metal. Yeah, so I'm just going to read uh, a comment that was made here from Nitish, which he said, uh, in the Pacific, the use of traditional art and cultural dances and songs have always been used as part of education and awareness. It would be great to have these fact sheets messages evolved into this so communities are able to comprehend the true impacts of plastic waste and take action towards it. Now I'm going to read a question, uh, put forward a question to all of the panelists from Melissa. Um, and you're welcome to just uh, any of you can answer this question. If the problem of plastic production lies beyond the Pacific, perhaps we need to find ways to stop the infiltration of harmful plastics into the region. So the question is, do you have any ideas on how to best achieve this? So Imogen, would you like to start? And then we move to Patty and then to Samoa. You know me, I've always got full of ideas. So I had this plan, we have this, uh, what is it, OCO. It's a organization of customs officers. So so under the Basel Convention, the, the serious plastics have, have uh, definitions. And so we can use the definitions from the Basel Convention uh, because they come with um, the import codes, the international import codes, which are about 10 digits long, but they're quite specific. 
And so we can, because we are islands and most things come by ship or plane, we can, in the import entry phase, talk our regional customs officers into developing a regional plan to, to pick up these plastics as they are imported. Some of it's packaging, in a lot of packaging around construction materials, surprisingly, and, um, and then to, to, to train people to refuse it. So there's a carrot and stick approach where you refuse it and better, much easier to prevent the problem than to try and mm -hmm. fix it. But if people persist on bringing it in, then they have to pay for the disposal. <laughs> so, Fair enough. <laughs> um, you know. Thank you, Imogen. Uh, well, now just because we're about to wrap up, Patty, did you want to add to to this question? Well, uh, I'm th I'm thinking about two things. One is um, I I do believe that uh, we always have to look at the source. And I know this may seem very challenging, but I mean, the source is really the people who create it. And I think we, we really need to um, address that. Uh, I, th I believe that we take that for granted because we think that, you know, we're just going to accept. But I mean, here we are trying to train other people to apply the three R's, but how can they? I mean, because it's always gonna be, it's always gonna be there. So I think we need to address the source. And the other thing is, um, you know, there was a return program that used to be thriving uh, in the Pacific, but then I don't know what happened to that. But I think we also need to revisit that, uh, you know, if, if I mean, that can be um, a, a backup or maybe, uh, in, you know, if, if we can't seem to address the, the source. Thank you, Patty. Uh, Ali Momo, did you want to add before we wrap up? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, some of the Pacific Islands have already introduced the ban that to me personally, it's not enough. It's not enough. Like, that's why we're working together with our colleagues here, try to have that instrument. Because not only to, because we're looking at alternatives, you know, here in the Pacific, we don't, we don't produce plastic. And then we look at the source like Patty has mentioned. So that's where the, the, the global instrument comes in so that we can, we can uh, intervene with the producers, you know, changing the design, all those things like circular economy, everything has to be there. So it's quite challenging for us in the Pacific, but you know, we are getting there. We are not sinking, we are not sinking, <laughs> we are fighting. Yeah. We're fighting. Okay. <laughs> I yeah. think that's a very good note to end uh, our panel discussion. Uh, I'd now like to introduce uh, Mr. Sifanaya Nawandra, who is the head of the Pacific Sub-Regional Office uh, of the United Nations Environment Program for his closing remarks. Uh, Sifa, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Chevelle. Hello, uh, everyone. Thank you, lovely ladies, for the wonderful work that you've done. I'll try to balance you out with uh, Setoa. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I think my job is just to give a reaction to many of the points and issues that have been uh, raised. I think there's a number of uh, key ones. I'm not sure how much time I've got, but I'll... Uh, try and be brief. The first is, um, it's a wonderful partnership, putting together academics and uh, people from the countries, UN agencies, uh, some private sector from uh, what I read between the lines in the fact sheets. And it's uh, how we need to work going forward with this. The second, uh, point I'd like to raise is this is not a short-term effort, it's a long-term one. Uh, it's already been going since uh, the early 1970s, if some of you don't realize, uh, with the regional seas conventions, the GPA for land-based sources of pollution. All these early elements um, lead to what we're doing now. 
I think one of the important shifts was when uh, we were able to connect the issue of waste to human health and uh, what's happening more recently, linking it to human rights issues. Uh, I think this is an important uh, uh, development and it's uh, what's given the needed uh, impetus to change this from an uh, environmental issue into a sustainable development uh, or existential issue. Um, there were some comments about uh, lessons to be learned from the UNFCCC process. Um, and this is quite true. Uh, there's a few of us who are still around in the Pacific now who are involved in the initial negotiations for the UNFCCC and the CBD in the early 1990s. A few names come to mind. Henry Taiki, who's now with WMO, Wayne King from the Cook Islands, uh, Espen, who's now, who used to be at SPREP and now moved to um, SBC and myself. We were young uh, negotiators then holding the bags of the senior people who were involved. And there's a lot of uh, knowledge that these people have that can be applied to the waste work. Um, from a UNEP perspective, uh, we've always supported and uh, been the convener for the work on waste and uh, marine litter, marine plastics. And we will continue to serve this role. Um, the upcoming uh, UNEA 5.2 that will uh, happen in uh, February and late February, March 2022 will be crucial to this process um, because I think that is where a lot of uh, negotiations and discussions of whether this becomes a uh, a legal instrument or continues as a ongoing uh, ad hoc process will happen. So you, Pacific countries need to be involved in that process. It's a good thing that we've made our intention quite clear through the Pacific Declaration. Uh, the timing was good, so it wasn't only uh, tabled here at SPREP, it was also tabled at the Asia Pacific Ministerial Forum when we were held in Korea in October. The Samoan uh, Prime Minister, Fiamme, was one of the keynote speakers, along with uh, the President of Korea and Ban Ki-moon. And she mentioned and championed the declaration at that, uh, during her uh, statement. Um, Going forward, I think um, the fact sheet is good as a, as a collection of the science and the knowledge that we have now. But going into negotiations, it needs to be put into a different format. So there needs to be work done on uh, uh, policy briefs that a lot of the stuff from the fact sheet can be put into that. And, uh, to help the countries when they go into these various uh, uh, negotiation fora, whether it's uh, BRS, COPS, or, or UNEA. Uh, finally, I think a lot of the groundwork is already done, that one on uh, coding that uh, Imogen mentioned, uh, customs and BRS, and a lot of the uh, UN agencies that deal with um, IMO have already agreed to the ASICUDA, which is the customs. Uh, and, uh, and so the, what, what I'm trying to say is a lot of the groundwork is, is done. What's needed is that political will to, to agree on a, how we go forward with this. Um, I think I'll, I'll end there. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Sefa. Uh, if you can reach to your react button once again and give, uh, give our panelists and Sefa a clap, now would be a good time. Thank you so much. I can see that everyone's checking in. Uh, on, on behalf of all the ladies, I would also like to thank Sefa and Setor for joining us um, in uh, equalizing the gender, <laughs> the gender numbers for us, you know. 
these are the things you have to get used to in the Pacific. Uh, gender is an issue and gender of, and women have certainly risen to, uh, to a certain uh, number. So without uh, adding anything further, we have a time limit uh, on behalf of the organizers. I would like to thank our panelists, Ms. Patty from the Department of Environment and FSM, Imogen from Island Sustainability Alliance of the Cook Islands, and Ali Momose Toa of the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment in Samoa. I thank all of our participants uh, this afternoon for joining us today. To access the fact sheets, do check the SPREP and UNEP websites or reach out to Sasha. Her email is on the uh, on the uh, chat uh, today. So with deep respects and gratitude, I wish you well on your day and and thank you once again for joining us. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you.